Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining our presentation today. We hope you've had a good MD Expo so far. Um, like she said, we'll be discussing the management of large-scale equipment installations from a VA perspective, um, and then also just highlight some qualities from our required processes that we feel um, are beneficial and could be applied to other organizations, even in a less formal way. And then also just our perspective as two young engineers who kind of got thrown into the fire at a large facility and kind of some things we've learned throughout the process of really taking ownership for some of these projects that we're going to talk about towards the end. Um, so with that being said, my name is Taya Pavelka. I went to Texas Tech for my undergraduate degree where I got uh, my bachelor's in mechanical engineering. And then I am now getting my master's degree through UConn, um, part of the CE internship program, um, serving as a clinical engineer at the VA North Texas healthcare system. So um, out of Dallas, Texas. And hey, everyone, nice to meet you all. Uh, so my name is Jomar Ian Contreras. Everyone just knows me as Ian. Uh, I'm also uh, from VA North Texas Healthcare System. I went to undergrad uh, at the University of Connecticut and then uh, stayed at UConn for my master's, also part of that same UConn CE internship program. And uh, I ended up completing that program back in 2020, in 2022 and then just stayed on at VA North Texas as a full-time staff biomedical engineer. This is just a fun disclaimer that we'd like you all to read. Thank you to our public affairs department. <laughs> Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so this is kind of what everything we're going to go into today, just so you have an idea of what um, we're going to talk about. So we're going to go into a little bit of a background uh, about our particular VA system and how our clinical engineering department uh, is sort of set up. Then we'll talk about each of the phases that um, you kind of go through during an uh, installation project from planning to procurement, installation, and then finally sustainment. And then we'll talk about some of the lessons that we picked up uh, over our course of being at VNR Texas and some of the products that we products that we uh, uh, were leading. And then we'll have some final thoughts. So, you know, we we won't guarantee that you'll be experts at project management or large scale installations, but we can promise that you'll get hopefully some inside some insight from you know what we've done in the past at VHA, and hopefully you can take it back with you to your organizations. All right, yeah, so first we're gonna talk a little bit about the background at VA North Texas. Uh, for those who are in the VA or who have worked with people in the VA, the common saying is you've been at one VA, you've worked at one VA, you worked at one VA. So this is sort of how our organization is set up from a clinical engineering department perspective. So we're actually under the office of the chief of engineering and under him, there's three different chiefs. You have the chief of maintenance operations and then the associate chief of development and construction. We sort of know him as the chief of projects uh, at our site. And then finally, you have uh, our chief of biomedical engineering. Under that, you have two different teams under our department. You have the biomedical equipment support specialist team. That's also our technicians team. And then you have the engineers team uh, where the clinical engineers are, where me and Taya work under. So our best team is broken up into three separate departments. We have the critical care team, the imaging team, and the information systems team, also known as our networking team. The IS team really works on clinical systems, um, bringing devices online. I think more and more every day, hospitals are getting their devices connected to the network. And so that team really handles that, along with EHR, connecting Vocera, and other things of that nature. Our imaging team, they're mainly focused on imaging modalities from CTs, ultrasounds, MRIs, linear accelerators. So that's their main focus. And then critical care, basically everything else in the hospital. So they deal with the anesthesia machines, uh, telemetry, physical, physiological monitoring, and things like that. So that's sort of the, uh, how we're broken down at VA North Texas. Yeah, so everyone always says at our site that VA North Texas is the second largest um, healthcare facility throughout the nation for the VA. Um, I asked our visit chief, what criteria was used to measure that ranking. We had a good laugh about how, how nobody has any idea, um, but we're going to continue on. So second largest VA in the country. Uh, we're a one-eight facility with approximately $155 million worth of medical equipment, um, approximately 9,000 devices, everything from CT, MR, Linux, um, surgical robots, interventional radiology imaging devices. Um, and we just really wanted to emphasize kind of how many large scale equipment um, implementations that we do, including, you know, fleets of infusion pumps and stuff like that, just to highlight the importance of a well-managed clinical engineering department with clinical engineers that know how to manage these types of projects um, efficiently. And then also just from a personal experience, we both obviously interned there um, and it's been 
a really good learning experience at a facility like this that allows you to see such different types of projects throughout your time there and really work on some some of these large scale equipment that um, some other people may, may not get an opportunity to work on um, this early in their careers. So. All right, so uh, this is our interactive portion of our presentation, our only one. So what is the need for large scale equipment installations? Can anyone maybe express their opinion or what they think uh, is the reason why we do this? Yes, sir. Right, yeah, so there definitely, uh, we have projects like that that we've been invo involved in uh, where we set up new uh, outpatient clinics. Uh, so in terms of that, we're, whether we're trying to expand for our healthcare system where we, uh, you know, build those types of new clinics or hospital buildings, that's definitely important. Anyone else? Yes. Increase right, increased quality of care. We definitely uh, take that into account when doing these projects. So um, those are all great ideas. Some of them were actually mentioned up here. So these are some of the ones that uh, we wanted to highlight. So um, one reason is the impact on patient safety and outcomes. When there's old legacy equipment that you know it's not being uh, used or it's broken down, uh, we're obviously not able to use those pieces of equipment on the patients themselves. So by replacing them, uh, some of the larger fleets or some of the high cost equipment that um, needs replacement, we're able to make sure that the patient safety is uh, always intact, and then the patient outcomes are always improving. And then from a cost effectiveness and efficiency, and efficiency standpoint, uh, these technologies are getting better and better every day. Uh, obviously with CTs, our MRIs, the scan times are a lot better. Uh, so from an efficiency standpoint, that's always good to replace those equipment when they're kind of getting a little old. Um, and a good equipment replacement plan is able to help make sure that uh, we're being responsible with the money, especially at a, on a VA level. It's not just private uh, money, it's obviously everyone's tax dollar. So we want to make sure we plan well to implement these large scale equipments um, that are cost effective to both the patient and just everyone in general. And then we work in a field that's always having emerging technologies, always innovating. So I know our hospital has always made it a point to make sure that we're trying to bring in all these new innovations into our hospital. So being on the forefront of that. And then someone touched upon it a little earlier, enhancing clinical workflow efficiency. So we've seen a lot of our departments having issues with their equipment, so it's um, creating some downtimes and there's a lot of corrective uh, maintenance work orders. And so bringing these new pieces of equipment allow them to either update their clinical workflows or just make them a little bit better for themselves. And then finally, just streamlining regulatory compliance, making sure that the equipment we bring in is meeting all these different um, standards. Yeah, so the next phase that we'll talk about is the planning um, phase, specifically with the VA-specific um, planning requirements for equipment, starting with the SEPG, or the Strategic Equipment Planning Guide. Um, this is the portal that's used for clinical services to input their equipment requests. Um, if you work at the VA, I'm sure you'll get a little bit bored by this, but it is important to remind ourselves of the why that we do this. Um, so from a clinical engineering perspective, the first thing that we do is we do a full inventory audit for our assigned um, services that are distributed by, or throughout the engineers. Um, and then we'll go through that list, look for anything that's end of life, approaching end of life, anything that we know is in poor condition or anything like that. And then we'll get with the course, uh, corresponding best team, so imaging or critical care, um, and go through that list. And we get their advice to make sure that we really encompass all of the need. Um, they obviously work on this equipment, know if anything's failing a lot or if the service hasn't been good or anything like that. So after that, we'll meet with the clinical service um, and we'll go through our consultation list with them and you know give them our advice as biomedical engineers of what we think that they need to get in for replacement um, and then also address any additional need that they have, whether it be their current equipment isn't meeting you know, functionality requirements or they think that their, their department's growing and they just need more devices in quantity. Um, so this is good for budget projections for upcoming fiscal year. So ideally we get a five-year plan, obviously at minimum a one-year plan um, just to be able to, you know, prioritize these projects from a biomed perspective and really get all of the clinical services and, you know, the best teams, like I said. Um, and then each request will go through an approval process just to ensure that everyone that needs to know does know. Um, this is good to make sure that equipment doesn't show up at our doorstep and nobody knows how to implement it or we're not allowed to implement it or anything like that. Um, and then, like I said, for the timeline, we'll review for the 
um, upcoming fiscal year now-ish. So we're reviewing for FY24 that will start in October, um, these equipment requests, and then we'll meet with our equipment committee um, at the end of every quarter to catch up on any requests that could put in late. So that committee includes logistics, biomedical engineering, and then the projects engineering team for anything that requires construction. And that's always a really good conversation to make sure that everyone's aware, especially with construction requirements, because I'll talk about this um, a lot more later in the presentation, but that sometimes does hold up um, equipment replacements and things like that. So, Yeah, so along um, in the planning phase with the SEPG, we also have something called the EER, which is our enterprise equipment request. So by the time the fiscal year rolls around, uh, after we budgeted that and the money is allocated to the different departments, um, you know, that's when the departments can actually go ahead and put in the request for the equipment. So previous year, they're like, we're going to spend this amount of money on ultrasounds, for example. And then this is the time where they can actually uh, go ahead and put the request in to actually buy those particular ultrasounds that they want. So this is another approval process that it kind of goes through. Um, sorry if it's a little small to read, but the department will put in the equipment request and then the service chief will review it. And then a bunch of different departments will go ahead and take a look at the request and see if it makes sense to actually buy and uh, install in the hospital. So you have a logistics review, biomed, SPS. Uh, the biomed review comes to us first since we're the main um, stakeholders for, the, uh, for that equipment. So from our perspective, we'll take a look at the request. Um, the engineers will go ahead and work with this particular BESSES or technicians that work on that piece of equipment. So if it's an anesthesia machine, we'll work with them, help get some insight as to whether or not that does make sense to replace. You know, We'll take a look at our current fleet, see if it uh, makes sense to replace some of it or to add an additional piece of equipment if we're trying to move vendors and things like that. Um, so we really rely on their expertise to uh, help with that process. And then again, depending on the equipment, it will move to our sterile processing team, OINT, engineering. Engineering is more for if uh, the equipment we're putting in, like the CTRMI, is going to require, require construction. So they're going to really look at as to whether or not they were able to budget that for that fiscal year, and you know, obviously approve it. And then OINT is for any type of cybersecurity measures or any devices that might go and touch the network. And then sterile processing, that's for like scopes and things like that. So again, this is another checks and balances that we have within the VA to make sure that all these different stakeholders these, uh, are able to see the equipment, understand what it is, and if it can actually be properly implement, implemented uh, into our site. Um, and again, like Taya said, it's also just to heap, help keep track of things. We, we've had issues in the past where things can kind of just show up in the biomed shop or in the department, and no one really knows uh, what it is or how to go about implementing it. So this really helps us kind of streamline that process a little bit more. Yeah, and then this strategic capital investment plan or SKIP, I like to think of as the SEPG um, for projects. Um, so it's a very similar process. They're putting in funding requests for certain projects for construction. Obviously, that includes bio, uh, medical equipment and non-medical equipment. So it's good for construction planning, funding requests, budget project, projection, and then especially prioritization of project requests. Um, and I just wanted to emphasize here, I know Ian and I have been working more with our projects team to kind of build a better, better relationship there because obviously, like I said, it'd be nice if we could just say, oh, we want an MRI and then we buy it and then we put it in. Um, but that's not how it works. And so I think it's important to really work with the engineering team that you have. Obviously, like we said, the structure of every organization is different. Um, and we've been lucky to work with some good guys on our project team that are willing to help us learn. But just integrating those departments, kind of making sure that your timelines align and you know, learning the facility requirements that come with your medical devices is really important. Um, that way you can talk intelligently when you attend these meetings with this department and make sure that you have a seat at the table and help prioritize these projects. Because if you know your cath lab's at end of service, projects isn't necessarily gonna know that. They're not gonna prioritize that project for you in these upcoming fiscal years. Um, so I just think it's really important to be able to expand our knowledge outside of just medical equipment evaluation or selection or whatever you're working on um, day to day uh, and kind of branch out and work with this department to really ensure that the timelines line up and you know, you're know you getting the equipment that you need so you're not preventing patient care. All right, so once uh, you know the SEPG and ER has been approved for the year and we've gone through those approval processes, um, the department in, in uh, conjunction with us can go ahead and help procure the actual devices that they're looking for. Uh, and that can go through a lot of different routes. Um, and as the VA is part of the government, we have to be uh, sending out as open and competitive bids. Um, so these aren't the only ones, but these are the main four that we've been using recently when we uh, procure and purchase equipment. So one is just going through local contracting. That's just creating a contracting package, package sending it to the contracting office. 
that can take some time. So a lot of these are used for different scenarios, uh, but local contract thing is more of the general use that uh, we go with. And then second one is electronic catalog or ECAT. Uh, been told many times that this is sort of the Amazon of our uh, for the VA, uh, where you can purchase equipment a lot faster. It gets delivered in a more timely fashion. So depending if the equipment is on ECAT, that's usually the route the departments will go just so they can see their equipment in a timely fashion. And then you have the National Acquisition Center or NAC. That's a government entity that works closely with the VA to purchase high tech, high cost. Uh, equipment, specifically imaging equipment like the CTs, MRs, um, linear accelerators. And we'll talk about more about that uh, in a bit and go a little in depth. And the final one is the Strategic Acquisition Center or SAC. Again, this is just another avenue to go through when it comes to purchasing equipment. For example, we've used this in the past to purchase our DaVinci robots and also uh, the service contracts for them. Like I said, we're gonna go a little bit more in depth to the NAC consolidation process, because again, this is how we purchase some of our large scale equipment, um, high tech, high cost. And so we'll go into some of these market research procurement package and uh, kind of go a little, give you a little bit more detail about each one. So first for the market research phase, so when we're actually uh, you know, going to procure the piece of equipment from the NAC, uh, we do something, we take part in what's called a NAC consolidation, uh, but Prior to that, we as clinical engineers will go meet with the clinical staff to understand their needs. So let's say, for example, we're trying to replace a CT, we'll go over to radiology, um, hopefully get some of their leadership and some of the techs that work on it on a day-to-day -day basis, understand some of the issues they've been having or the recent years or currently having. Uh, so that way we can, you know, again, understand uh, ways to improve that with the new piece of equipment we're trying to implement. From there, we take all the information that we gathered and then we will uh, have vendor meetings uh, between the clinical engineers, the BESs, and uh, obviously the vendors to present to them the issues that we're facing on a department level with the current equipment we have. And then obviously they'll give us their solutions and we'll kind of go back and forth to make sure we can kind of understand, you know, again, what our needs are and then what they can do to help re resolve those. And then from there, we'll have formal vendor presentations with the clinical staff, uh, the vendors will, uh, obviously come on site or nowadays it's more virtual to present on their products that they're trying to offer the, the clinical team. We do a little bit more research here and there and obviously continuously get the imaging best input uh, in this case for the CT to really make sure that uh, the equipment that's gonna come in makes sense for the department and also just for the biomed team in general. And then the actual procurement package consists of different things. So uh, at the VA again, we have to be uh, open and competitive so we don't really use quotes too much. We use it sort of as a baseline to understand what the vendors are offering us, but we use something called technical specifications. So there are these objective tech specs that we uh, build out with each of the vendors. Um, again, we don't tailor it to any particular vendor, but we'll have things like what's the KV power or can you offer these specific software packages to help the clinicians? Or even for, again, for CT, what's the bore size? Like we need a minimum of 72 uh, and things like that. So we'll build that out. Uh, between us, the best is in the clinical staff. And then depending if the equipment is over a million dollars, we'll go through another process called high cost high tech. Uh, make sure that there's money actually obligated to fund the purchase of this equipment. And then finally, because most of these imaging projects involve some type of construction and site prep, we'll work with our projects team to get some project numbers so that again, they're aware of the project and to make sure that they had budgeted the year prior to, make, uh, to actually fund the actual uh, site prep. Yeah, so for the last step in the NAC consolidation for procurement of imaging equipment is the formal evaluation and the best value selection and justification. Um, so that's where after the NAC puts out those tech specs that we wrote, all the vendors can bid based off those tech specs and they're required to put whether they meet, exceed, or do not meet those requirements. Um, and then as clinical engineers at our facility, we'll go through line by line of those tech specs and each vendor um, that bid on it, so that could be anywhere from one to 11. Um, for each of the modalities and make sure that the information that they provided is accurate, which requires a full documentation review. Um, and then of course, that is the you know, evaluation of their ability to meet our need. And normally when we meet with our clinical staff, there's a few key things that they're really, you know, really needing for functionality in their department. So we'll emphasize those things on this best value selection document as well. Um, and I do think this is good. If you ask any of the engineers that work at a VA if they enjoy doing it, they'll probably say no. But um, I do think that it helps prevent subjectivity. I'm not going to say that it eliminates it, 
Um, but just having that level of objectivity can be really helpful to kind of pull yourself away from, you know, the relationships that you have with vendors, any political or marketing schemes that you end up getting into on accident. Um, and so with these tech specs, for example, if your requirement is 50 pounds, one of them is 35, the other one's 45, those both still exceed the requirements. You can't say, oh, one's better than the other because they both still exceeded the requirements. So that's an example of how you're kind of removing yourself from just selecting a vendor based off your relationship with their sales team or, you know, service history, although that is accounted for. And it's not always the most expensive one and it's not always the cheapest one. So I think that even though this isn't required at private organizations, obviously, the takeaways of it um, are really important to help your facility get equipment that really meets the need at an effective cost um, and, you know, keep moving forward with, you know, equipment types that are really helpful for your clinicians. Yeah, and just to add two more things to that, I think it also helps keep the vendors honest and competitive throughout the whole thing. Because again, it's not based off necessarily any relationship, but what they uh, can offer at, uh, with their product. And then secondly, uh, I think from our side of things, it also helps us to not stay so stagnant on a particular vendor. I mean, obviously we have good service and good quality um, throughout years and years. You know, it's good that we maybe cater that vendor, but um, you know, there's still new technology out there. These vendors are competing every day. So it makes sure that we can actually objectively look at the competition and pick something that actually will work for our site and for our, our veterans. Um, and then this is just an example of a construction timeline. If you actually go to the next slide, it's a design bid build example, which is what we normally do. So this example from the Mead work group um, is just an example of the design and construction timelines along with the equipment timeline. This is kind of what I was saying earlier about kind of expanding your scope away from just the top line, just understanding the process that you are required to do to get equipment um, and then pop in when it's time to install it because normally there's issues that arose that you didn't have any say in that could have been prevented. And as we know, it's cheaper to change things at the beginning than it is at the end. So I just was using this graphic to emphasize how you need to be able to jump from box to box. You need to participate in each phase of the design and then you need to be present for the construction to ensure that these things are happening to the standards that your department has, that your clinicians have, you know, for effective and safe use of the equipment. So that's what I was just trying to emphasize here. Um, and then this is just a turnkey example, obviously less convoluted than some of the, the past few slides. So we're hoping to try some of these too, but that's still an important aspect to consider when you're working on a turnkey in implementation. You know, you can't just kind of forget about it, which is what I was trying to emphasize with these slides. Um, and then for the next part about installation, which is where obviously most of the work comes in for us, um, some of the projects that we'll discuss specifically later. Um, I know there was a lot of procurement before we got here, so then when we got here, there was a lot of installation. So for this slide, I know we all know kind of the basics of project management. I know we're going to talk about the risk um, stakeholders and some communication aspects a little bit later, but I want to focus on resources scheduling, and then a little bit about integration. So for with resources, um, I obviously have only worked with VA for about two years. Um, going in, I didn't know who anybody was. I didn't know how to get anything or who to answer, who was there to answer my questions. Um, so I just think it's important to evaluate the resources that you have, whether you've been doing this for a long time or not. If you go to a new facility, you know, you're going to have to relearn those things. Um, and then again, for specific projects, for individual projects, are you working with a department um, of clinicians that are really engaged? Or are you working with a department that wants you to do all the work and then they just get to use it when it's done? So these are important evaluations to make when you're starting so that you can plan for that um, when you're assessing risk, which I know Ian's going to talk about in the future or later in the presentation. Um, and then that kind of plays into the schedule. You know, I think it's a really important skill to be able to assess the risk and then create a schedule that accommodates for the potential of risk without extending the project too long. You know, you don't want to delay patient care by leaving too much leeway time. But you also don't want to make impossible deadlines that you can't meet. So I just think that that's an important, and those kind of go hand in hand, utilizing your resources to solve any issues that arise, but also using your resources to prevent those issues from happening in the first place. Um, and then integration, you know, you're going to keep hearing things are becoming more integrated, more networking, more connecting systems throughout the hospital. Um, so I just think it's important to consider that throughout all these phases when you're procuring, when you're market um, market researching and all that stuff. So I just wanted to hit on those. All right, so for the key stakeholders, so I think when I was first put on some of my uh, projects early on in my uh, time at VNR Texas, uh, I think it was made apparent to actually understand who all your key stakeholders were. I think in the beginning it was 
sort of hard to figure out who I was supposed to meet and uh, go for different things. These are some of the ones that we've picked um, based off our more recent projects that uh, of the people who are usually there and who we usually meet with, whether that's ourselves, the vendor project manager, the clinical end user facilities or projects, uh, the contractors. Uh, all these people definitely are your team when you're going into the project. And I think sometimes we can forget that um, it is a team effort to get these installations in place. And you really have to understand, you know, some of the strengths and weaknesses. Uh, if, you know, maybe your project team isn't as strong as it could be or that relationship is, you know, that's something to work on in the future. So really being able to figure out who they are and uh, ask questions from the beginning. I think, again, when I was first starting, I had to really try and figure out what everyone really did because there are a lot of intricacies involved with all these different players for one particular project. So for me, by asking all these questions, understanding at least a general idea of what each person did, as we went through uh, the projects, uh, we were able to pinpoint, you know, if something went wrong, I could go to projects, for example, uh, if it came to the construction part. And then, you know, if the IT side, I knew to go to uh, such and such. So just understanding your key stakeholders, who they are, um, what they bring to the game, and, you know, obviously how to manage them throughout the entire project, something that, uh, you know, we found to be important. Sure. Yeah, so BES is the VA specific term for the biomed technician. So it means uh, biomedical equipment support, support specialist. So just an acronym. And I just wanted to comment on that too, going back to kind of the scheduling and resources, obviously knowing who those people are within your own department and then obviously without outside of your department. Um, it's not ever difficult or not ever easy to schedule that many people for a project. You know, that's going to be one of the hardest parts of every project to make sure that everything stays on track. If someone, you know, gets sick and goes out, you need to know who to go to. And that's why I was saying it's a valuable skill. Um, and obviously you gain that skill through experience. Um, like I said, we're young engineers. We're still working on gaining that experience, but using those resources, going to people that you know have worked on projects similar at your own VA, at other VAs, um, and asking for some of the things that kind of held them up or things that went well, some tips and tricks that they have. Obviously, you may have a nationwide connected hospital, but I'm sure there's someone that you know that has you know, worked on a similar project or come across similar um, issues that you're facing or going to face. Um, so for the next part, we're going to talk about sustainment, so the post-installation phase. Um, just some brief overview of some aspects that we have learned to kind of consider to make sure we really close out the project, not to say, oh, it's there, we're done. Because um, obviously these are high risk projects that you're working on when they're this large scale. And they're gonna be you know, high on the executive levels list of things to watch out for. And so you wanna make sure that you have all of this prepared um, even after you implement it. So first I was just gonna talk about inventory management. I was really passionate about uh, inventory management when I first got to the VA, wrote a paper about it for school. Um, <laughs> so first, I'm just talking about recalls. We get a lot of recalls, just as I'm sure all of you do, um, and not having a proper inventory, you're going to miss some devices that are impacted by a recall, um, which obviously poses a patient safety issue and makes your job much more difficult. Um, and unless there's a magic wizard in your shop who knows all the equipment, um, you're probably going to end up missing something. And similar for a PM schedule, if your devices aren't assigned to your shop, or you know the manufacturer is wrong, or the equipment category is wrong. Um, you may end up missing some PMs, which obviously, again, is going to pose a patient safety issue. And then kind of going full circle back to that step G that we talked to talked about at the beginning for replacement planning. I said we do a full inventory audit, but we can only audit the inventory that we know is ours. And if it's not assigned properly, if it's not accurate, the age is inaccurate, we're going to miss some stuff for replacement. And that's when we usually end up giving, getting uh, emergency procurements that we have to do in order to you know, get this equipment last minute, whereas if we could have planned for it, obviously would be a lot smoother, more cost efficient, safer. Um, and then moving on just to service contracts, I've sat in on the contract presentation earlier, but whether it be for preventive maintenance, repairs, upgrades, any type of service level that you're getting, you need to evaluate. And I know Ian will talk about this a little bit too, but preparing for that, we talked about how long it can take to get a contract. You think, oh, the warranty's a year, that's plenty of time. Probably not actually plenty of time. So. Um, make sure you're considering this, make sure that you're, again, your inventory is accurate so that when you're forming these contracts, you can make sure that you have the necessary information to, to get everything covered. I know with the VA, it's hard to even get a contract modded, so it's an important consideration. And then for uh, the training portion, uh, I think uh, our department has taken on a lot of this responsibility because we 
help make sure that both the clinical staff and our own best technician staff get trained. Uh, so even from the get-go when we're doing our tech specs, we try to work it out where it says somewhere in there that we're asking for ideally some complementary training uh, for our clinical apps team or for the clinical team and then obviously for our technicians. Um, for the clinical team, it's important so that they are actually able to use the equipment to, the, uh, to its full utilization. We've had instances in the past where equipment just sitting there because uh, the clinical staff hasn't been trained and uh, they just decided not to bring it up and that unit just, been, it just sits there for a while. So, uh, and we actually, we actually also tend to have a lot of turnover at our particular VA. So we've been able to manage with the vendors on getting uh, clinical training for and for our site uh, whenever there is turnover. Again, it's just to make sure that the clinical team is using the equipment to the best of abilities. It's not sitting there and actually uh, being put to work. And then from the best perspective, or the technician's perspective. Um, a lot of our technicians just want to learn and uh, professionally develop. So I think we had a lot of training in the past, but when COVID-19 hit, a lot of it got uh, kind of postponed. So we've been sort of trying to roll that out more and more. And then with some of our new equipment that we purchased, we were able to get that complimentary training for them. Uh, and obviously, again, it's for their benefit, but also for ours, because then we can go ahead and look at some of those service contracts that we've had for a while that you know we're putting a lot of money into the vendors for them to do a full service uh, service contract for us. Uh, but now that we're getting more of our, our technicians trained, we can look at the contracts and see which ones we can actually start taking off, whether that's our anesthesia machines, turn some of our full service contracts a first look for our imaging uh, units. Uh, and then uh, again, it just allows our team to be fully trained in-house to do PMs and do first looks for a lot of these large scale equipment. And then for equipment planning, uh, it's kind of sort of a full circle moment. Um, you know, you plan in the beginning and then when you're done, um, when you're sustaining, you also have to plan for when the uh, life cycle of that unit is coming to an end. So there's a lot of factors you can use. I think the one that a lot of people tend to use is age, but there's also different things that we've started to look at our site to make sure that you know we're not just looking at one uh, end of life factor and just really planning out that timeline so that we're not in a rush or an emergency to replace equipment and we're not um, you know putting that burden on the clinical team or even on our site and just knowing the importance of which uh, piece of equipment to replace first, especially the uh, high dollar equipment and large scale ones. Okay, so for the last section of our presentation, we're gonna talk about lessons learned. We're gonna go into some generic lessons that we just wanted to portray to you guys and then go into some personal experiences of projects um, and kind of how we learned those, those lessons throughout the process. So first I want to talk about over communication and documentation. I have on here, you've heard it a million times before and we're here to say it again. Um, obviously communication is important in project management. That is a known fact. But I think a lot of times we think that we're doing enough communication. Oh, well, I told them that. But you can't really rely on everyone to listen to the first time, um, even if it is in writing, even if they did read it. So something that I definitely learned coming into this, especially with working like, with so many stakeholders like we discussed, is really just getting over my hesitation to send too many emails. Ian's never really had that hesitation, so he's been fine on that front. But uh, something that I had to work on to overcome uh, at the beginning of my, my the VA, and then documentation. Again, when I came, everyone was, documentation, documentation, documentation. I was like, I'm an organized person. Of course I'm gonna document my work. Um, but then you kind of get caught up in your day-to-day -day tasks and things are getting thrown at you from all angles. So that kind of slips off the radar a little bit. Um, documentation is, again, this important for a site like ours that has two active intern programs going on at one time, PCS and then also the Yukons, obviously. So we do have a lot more turnover with our engineers working on these projects um, than some sites might expect. So documenting that process and, you know, the engineer that bought the machine probably isn't the same engineer that's installing the machine. So especially because you saw the timeline, it's long. Um, so that's just another important factor that you want to make sure that you're doing and even if you don't have active internship programs going on you know you never know when someone's going to leave your department so uh, and then another quick tip that i think we both learned is just having um, good pre-planning and risk assessment uh, i think i realized the value of a good uh, thorough kickoff meeting with all the stakeholders involved as i mentioned before it can really be hard to get everyone uh, on one meeting especially if it's virtual uh, so having that that kickoff meeting to understand what the game plan is for implementing the piece of equipment you know what each person's or each stakeholder's role is gonna be. And again, if issues come up, like how we're gonna address them. Um, I think in the past, sometimes we, biomed is thrown into projects uh, towards the tail end or even the middle and things kind of get convoluted, especially when the medical equipment piece is involved. Um, and, you know, it's better to take a, a lot more time in the beginning to plan than 
you know, trying to rush that and then you're going through your project and you're hitting these obstacles and hitting these problems and you're trying to address them here and now, it just starts pushing that timeline back and back and back. Um, so again, you know, one thing is also don't assume, ask questions from the start as much as you can. And again, just really understanding who your team is and making sure that a general plan is uh, set up from the get-go to really avoid, uh, not necessarily avoid the risk, but being able to be ready for them and address them in a timely fashion to keep those timelines and go lives uh, not very smooth. Yeah, and finally, I just want to talk about the importance of having a physical presence on a site, um, especially over the past couple of years. Obviously, everything's kind of transferred to virtual. Um, but I do think, especially with large scale projects like this, anything that requires construction, physically being there can be really empowering through your work relationships. Um, and then also just help expedite issues. Something that may come up on the day of installation could be solved if you were there right then and there, rather than escalating into a bigger problem that ends up delaying the project. Um, I was working on an MRI replacement recently, and the construction lead was telling me how people think they can run projects from their trucks now, and he's been doing this for 60 years, and that's for work. So um, I just think that that's important. Obviously, you don't have to be there for the entirety of the project, um, but that is, again, another aspect of you kind of branching out, making sure that you're learning about um, the various different aspects that you're working on when you are serving as a project manager. Um, and I know that's easier said than done for a lot of people. Obviously, I have the title of intern or trainee, or I've only worked here for a year. It's easier to get people, kind of convince them to help you learn. Um, but I just think it's important to try to continue doing that throughout your, your entire career, and I hope to keep doing that throughout my career. Um, so for this next part, we're just going to talk about some personal projects that we've done and hopefully convince you that we're qualified to give this presentation. Um, so the first project that I ever did when I got to the VA was a deployment of some CRMs across various clinical specialties. Um, so this really was a simple project, that's why I'm starting with it, but it was a really good introduction into these project management techniques that we've been talking about, um, getting multiple different clinical stakeholders, IT stakeholders, project stakeholders, everything like that involved and really just you know, familiarizing myself with the hospital, familiarizing myself with the VA processes that we have to do. Um, and, you know, sometimes I'd be like, why do we have to do that? And I would get to the point and be like, oh, that's why we have to do that. So hopefully this presentation has just served as kind of a reminder of the, the importance of the whys. Um, it's important to ask yourself those questions when you're obviously doing this again and again throughout your career. But um, that project has helped me move on to bigger and better things that I'll talk about at the end. And then for myself, uh, this project uh, is not the first one I necessarily started with, but it was probably um, one of the more intricate ones. So uh, back in September of 2021, I was the lead to actually procure some new replacement uh, general x-ray rooms. Um, we were just replacing our fleet, our entire fleet within our healthcare system. Uh, there were some really old legacy units that we've had for, I think, 10 plus years. I think past end of life, uh, we had two rooms that had been down for two plus years. Um, but anyway, so it was really important to the radiology team and also our, our biomed staff that we get those replaced. So went ahead and did the whole NAC process for that. We got it awarded. And now we've been uh, basically finishing up the actual implementation of those GenRads. And yes? Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, uh, another intricate part of it is not only that it was just 11 large scale equipments that included construction, uh, that they're also across different sites in our, within our systems. Uh, most of them were were within our Dallas facility, Dallas facility, and then one was in our or two were in our Fort Worth CBOC, which is about 45 minutes away, uh, and then one was in our Plano CBOC. Our CBOC is just being uh, an outpatient clinic, and then another one was in our Grand Prairie. So I had to work not only with multiple stakeholders, and the vendors had different uh, project managers for different areas. So I was working with a lot of different people, uh, but also for our, our outpatient clinics or our CBOC. I was my first time working with the lessor team. So those particular facilities we don't own, so it makes it a little bit harder, a little more tricky to actually implement these projects because we got to get approval from the lessor, who's basically the owner of the building, um, work with their team and sort of another middleman to go through. So that was an interesting piece of this project that uh, I definitely was able to gain a little bit more experience on how to navigate that. Uh, it was, again, just a lot of meetings, a lot of, like Tia said, more physical presence for those. I ended up just driving out to them. Uh, and yeah, so, that we're almost done with them. We have two Fort Worth units that are completely in place. I think they just finished clinical apps training this week. We had the physicist test last week. Uh, so the, uh, the, te the, the clinical techs, super excited. They've had really old equipment there for a while now. So they're able to really start seeing patients. And I believe their throughput is a lot faster too as well. 
Um, and so kind of going along with this, my, my next project that um, I've been super proud of is uh, the installation of two mobile MRIs at our other Fort Worth, or at our outpatient clinics, one in Fort Worth and one in Tyler. Again, our Fort Worth clinic is about 45 minutes away from our main Dallas facility. And then our Tyler clinic is about two hours away. So this initiative with the MRI started a couple of years back with our uh, executive team really wanting to, uh, well, they saw there was a definite backlog with, MR, with uh, MRI scans and cases throughout our healthcare system. So they really wanted to uh, bring it, bring those cases back because we were starting to put a lot of those out to uh, private hospitals for community care. Uh, so it was kind of throwing a lot of money out to them. So again, they wanted to bring some more MRIs to those outpatient clinics. So for one, we didn't have to do the community care and also those veterans don't have to drive two plus hours sometimes, um, you know, to go get an MRI scan. And so another reason why we went with the mobile unit is because we just didn't get approval or the funding to actually build out uh, at the time for the Fort Worth or the Tyler Clinic. And that's been an interesting uh, project. It was just having, I mean, it was basically MRI installation, but more managing the trailer as well. So not only was I working with the imaging vendor, but I was also working with the trailer vendor and uh, trying to track the actual trailer moving from Ohio all the way down to Texas was definitely fun. Sometimes I couldn't uh, get a hold of him. So I wasn't sure if they got, you know, if it got broken down on the highway or something, but both of them have been successfully installed. Uh, they're seeing, starting to see patients now. And uh, I've been actually, the interesting part of this now is that uh, we had meetings for a while about whether or not, or who was gonna be in charge of the actual trailer itself, Biomed, obviously was gonna take care of the MRI um, and its peripherals, but there was a big question between us and our engineering department about who was actually gonna take care of that trailer. We ended up just uh, deciding I was going with a service contract. So I'm working on that now uh, with the trailer vendor and that's definitely been an interesting process. And overall, it's, I think it's been good again for the Tyler and the Fort Worth Clinic because they don't have to send out those patients directly to Dallas and it saves them time. Uh, and yeah, that's sort of led into the TAVE project over at Fort Worth. Yeah, so in Fort Worth, we're actually adding an MRI, so we're going to um, build out the radiology suite to include that. And then for that one, we're in the later design phases. So that was kind of the example I was getting, giving earlier of including yourself in those, uh, making sure that all your requirements are met so that later you don't have to worry about that. And then also one that's actively going on right now is the replacement MRI that I was talking about. Um, and I just wanted to tell a quick story about this. Um, it got installed two weeks ago. Um, so I've been working with the deinstall team and I have been working, like I said, with the contract leads for the electrical and the chiller and everything like that, but day of installation comes and it's kind of hard to gain respect from construction guys when you look like me. Um, so they kind of came in and was like, well, you know, how can I, you know, assert my dominance without being rude? So my strategy was just to know all the answers. Um, and then I didn't go on barking orders. And then I, when questions were asked, I knew the answers to them and I was able to form a good relationship with those guys. And, successful so so far knock on wood um so we'll get that activated soon before i graduate from the program so 